five years ago, I was asked by one of our clients to deliver a virtual workshop. Now, to be asked to deliver a virtual workshop when all we've ever done for 15 years here at iSpeak was instructor-led in-person classes, that was a big ask by our client. But the request came because they have people all around the globe and they didn't have the expense to be able to bring them together for a live workshop. And so they asked us to deliver a virtual workshop. And I know that I panicked quite a bit as I thought about this using some tool called WebEx. I didn't really know what it was. And I started having all of these questions about how's that gonna work? I don't think that the live session will work as well in person in, in a virtual environment as it would if I were live with the audience. And so I started having all these negative thoughts and how are my students gonna react and will they have their video turned on? Will they have their audio turned on? And will they be doing their email or will they be focused on listening to me teaching? Will they be engaged or will they be disengaged? I don't know if any of you teachers have had some similar feelings when last spring, thanks to COVID, all of the classes were switched to virtual. Different platforms that we used from Zoom, WebEx, Adobe Connect, Google Classrooms, go down the list, every school district had to make some quick adjustments on how they were going to deliver their classes in a virtual environment. I wanna say welcome. My name is Kevin Karstick, and today we are gonna be co-presenting with my friend and colleague, Bill Krieger, and Bill, I want to ask you, when we had to start delivering virtual presentations, how did you feel and what were some of those thoughts that were going through your head? Well, pretty much terrified, Kevin. Uh, <laughs> it was such a new venue uh, to be able to present. It felt like the first time I was on a conference call and you were just talking to dead airspace and wondered if anybody was out there. But I'll tell you, some of my fears were with the platform itself. Could I use it? Would I get lost in it? Would I lose connectivity and all of a sudden I disappear and the students all wonder where I am and then how would the client certainly feel about that? Uh, I, I mean, you, at times I, you can't see the audience because bandwidth doesn't let you do that and it's just like talking to an empty room. These are certainly the challenges that we face when we're moving into virtual. And I, and I know that Kevin, you and I in our hearts and certainly with our school teachers, uh, they love the social interaction. And now all of a sudden, here we are where we're talking to a computer screen and hope that there's people out there that is engaged. Hey, as we go through this particular webinar, Kevin and I want you to certainly reach out to us with any questions or comments or feedback. Uh, you can use your chat window. You reach down there and uh, click on that. That window will open up for you so it's there. And we'll do our best. We'll be looking at those and looking for your, your questions and comments. And, and we'll take time to make sure we're taking, every, taking care of you and any of your inquiries. Also, let's just kind of play with that right now, let you use it. So, hey, jump in your chat window right now. And there's actually two things I'd like to have from you. One, we'd like to hear where you're from, where are you calling in from? And also, uh, if you are a, a teacher, what grade level will you be teaching this year? And I know there's probably still some ifs about that, but uh, yeah, jump in the chat window and let's hear from you. Excellent. So we got Teresa from the Round Rock ISD teaching second grade. So Teresa, thanks for jumping into the. Yes, I love room. second grade, Teresa. <laughs> I hope you're excited. Uh, Teresa, are, do you know how this is going to roll for you in the Round Rock School District? Uh, are you going to be able to be in the classroom with students uh, with second grade or will you be doing some virtual? I, I'm guessing since you're here, <laughs> you're gonna be virtual, right? Uh, yes. So uh, yeah, will, will you be going into your classroom and broadcasting from there or will you be able to be at home and from your home, oh, from your classroom, yes. Good, will, will your school have anybody 
uh, actually in the classroom? Will anybody, can, will students be showing up on campus? That's always uh, the challenge. I, I yeah. know that uh, my wife's teaching school for, and she teaches first grade, uh, Teresa. And so she's there trying to figure out what that's all going to be. How many are going to show up? How much will be virtual? And trying to work all that out right now. And, uh, the, and of course, they haven't quite answered those yet. Right. A lot of unknowns right now, isn't there, Bill? So yes. again, everybody, go to the chat. Give us a couple of bits of information. We'd love to know where are you dialing in from, what school district you're in, and what class are you going to be teaching so that we kind of get an idea of where you guys are at. Now, obviously, those listening to the recording, you'll be able to know that we'll make a lot of adjustments based on that feedback. And it's a one-way street chat window, meaning that when you chat, it only goes to me and Bill. We're the only ones that see that. And so the rest of the group, just because we have so many people that are on with us, we don't want to cause a lot of uh, crossover. So Bill, really excited. We've got a great agenda plan for everybody. We're going to start with some characteristics of a bad presentation virtually. We've all sat through some bad webinars, maybe even have taken some bad classes. Hopefully we haven't been the bad teachers from a virtual standpoint, but we're gonna talk about those characteristics. We're gonna talk about the use of video and sometimes lack of it, how we use our voice, how we structure the message, how we design our slides, and then really getting to understand the technology. I think for me, rewinding five years ago, really understanding how the different platforms work. And even over the last six months, having experienced Zoom, Microsoft Teams, Adobe Connect, and even this morning teaching a four hour workshop using WebEx, they're all different, very, very similar, have very similar functionality, but they have some different uses and how you do something in one might be a little different in another. And we're gonna talk about some of those. So Bill, let's jump in and let's get some feedback. I want everybody, again, it's one way street, but go to that chat window and give us a characteristic. What is something that you have seen You've experienced this from the receiving and the audience side that doesn't work in a virtual presentation. What doesn't work when we have been in the audience? We're the students and what have you seen that doesn't work? Let's go to that chat window. All right, Bill, we got one right here. I love it. And, and I want you to talk to this for just a second, Bill. Not, let me do the joke. I'll let you follow up on it. Okay. Somebody just said in the chat, when people read every word that they're going to say on their slides. Yeah, yeah. Now, this does eliminate the need to memorize your presentation, but it could cause distractions because then the audience is focused on that and they're not really listening to you. So talk about this where it could be a, 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 a good thing, but it also could be a bad thing. Bill, explain that. Uh, yeah, thank you. And, and it really does depend on the situation and the audience and really what our purpose of showing the slide is for. Uh, I can tell you as a high school student, this is the last kind of slide I ever want to see. Or and I don't, adult. And, yeah, and I don't want you to read it to me, Kevin. I do know how to read. Uh, you know, if I'm in elementary school, I might uh, want a little more text on my, I mean, we've got second grade teachers here. These kids are pretty decent readers by the time they hit into second grade, but certainly increasing their vocabulary and their proficiency. So there may be a little more text that's needed. Yeah, uh, certainly we don't want a slide like you just showed me though, where it's just filled with, and, and that is a struggle, which really Teresa's brought up that brings up another point. And that is we go monotone when we're doing a lot of reading. It just, it becomes a monologue and we go flat. Yep. Now, I, I'm, my experience with elementary school teachers is that they're rarely monotone ever. They, they're, they've got an audience that knows that their voice has to be pretty dynamic. For sure. uh, and so, yeah, I think they're going to be there with it. Uh, but certainly, we don't want to overwhelm with information on the slide. Yeah, well, I think we've seen that. I'm going to give you an example here of a slide that I found on the internet. And it could be overwhelming to anybody. I don't care if we're talking sixth, sixth grade, second grade, or 12th grade. This could be too much because I'm trying to absorb a lot of information. I'm looking at clip art and just really overwhelmed by a slide like this. So this could be another thing that really turns us off from wanting to pay full attention to whoever's speaking. Correct. In fact, it's a disengaging tool, not an engaging tool, which is what we want the slide to be. For sure. 
So we got so many things. The chat window is just blowing up right now. So Bill, what are some other things that we've seen in the presentation? Let's go to this list right here. We've got somebody who doesn't land good eye contact. Now, let me give yeah. you an example. I use two monitors when I teach virtually. And this is my laptop over here. And how does this feel, Bill, if I'm going to sit here and be looking at my slides while I'm teaching and you're going to get a nice side of side view of my head, which is really a nice little gray strip right there. <laughs> yeah, well, don't, come on, buddy. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, it, it, we know that in, in our culture that making eye contact is, is paramount. Uh, we want credibility, we want trust, we want approachability. That has to happen really through eye contact. But how do you do that, right? I mean, here we are in a virtual setting. If we're in a classroom, I, I can look at Jimmy over in the corner and say, hey, you need to straighten up and get back to work. Uh, in a virtual classroom, this can be very difficult. And how do I know that I'm even looking at them? And of right. course, the answer is you look at your camera. Yep. And when you look at your camera, it looks like you're looking at us. And that's the other struggle about monotone and reading is that if I'm reading, I'm not looking at the camera and I'm not making eye contact with my audience. Uh, now I, I just look like I'm, I'm not engaged into what you're saying and you're not talking to me. Yeah. Well, another one in the chat that just came up was somebody who's distracting. They have a distraction for the students themselves. And so let's talk about distractions. I've got <laughs> two of them. Bill's giving a good example of somebody else who's in the room and that could be our own kids. It could yeah. be pets. I, I've got one, sometimes two of my dogs that are right here with me and they're fine until the doorbell rings and then they go crazy and it takes a few minutes to settle them down. Or my kids who are now 22 and 19 might come into my office forgetting that I'm in the middle of a class and that becomes a distraction. Right. I have two-year-old twins that want to bust in and they start pushing the buttons on the computer. <laughs> now, when you said you have two-year-old twins, what do you mean? Yeah, well, that's my grandsons. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you. Hey, I, I just look old. I'm really about 35. Well, I didn't think you were a day older. <laughs> yeah. Now, we've also got distractions like filler words. Have we ever heard people say, um, and uh, and you know, and so, and right? over and over and over and i think it happens more in virtual environments than in person because there's the insecurity of being in our home office and not really having that interaction and we're not really thinking and maybe overthinking sometimes so i think filler words can be a distraction any others that you've seen or maybe we've done yeah well and you know i've been guilty of everything that you're you're sharing with our group and and that's a struggle because in the virtual we worry about blank space right where yeah. nothing's being said and the audience now starts to wonder if they had lost connectivity if you're not talking and the longer that pause is or break is for us as the teacher uh, the more our anxiety goes up and then the filler words start showing up yeah that's always one of my fears is that i would lose my place and then I'm in here shuffling papers, trying to figure out where I'm supposed to be. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a real fear. Yeah, been there, done that. And, and let's add the and to this, which is the technology. So not only am I trying to find my place, not only am I trying to think about where we're going next, I'm figuring out how, how do I go to the next screen? Are the students seeing the screen that I just thought I was sharing and the video that I thought I was sharing and the chat window, where did it go? And, and all of those other technology issues. So all of those things lead to a bad presentation or a bad class day, and we've all had those. So Bill, why are we starting with this? Why are we starting our webcast talking about all this bad stuff? Well, it's it, more than likely some of it's gonna happen to us and we're, we're gonna figure out how to get through it. But also we, these are things we want to avoid. Yeah. Uh, these are things that are disengaging. They cause a lot of stress on me as a presenter or a teacher. And, and I want to have some comfort level with that so I can really interact with the student. Uh, it, it really is all about them. And I want to make sure they get the information, that it's engaging. I also want to hear feedback from them that they got it and understood it and are doing it. And I need to feel real comfortable in this environment and how I act in it so that that takes place. Yep. And, and the other key part of that that you could end on there is the retention that how much are they going to remember from all this because that is the whole key of this that we're delivering this information we need their attention we want them to process it comprehension 
and then have that retention afterwards that they're going to be able to remember this and ultimately use this and help them in life. Yeah. What did yeah, you we're, just say? We're, we're yeah, exactly. <laughs> We're balancing all of these things. And so let's break these down. Let's go to video next. Let's talk about that. And one of the things that we want to do is make sure that our video is turned on. That I do think that when I turn my video off, then I start to wonder, I'm just hearing a voice. And you're not, you're really wondering, are, are they there? What are they doing? I think the video is a two way street in terms of we should have our video on as the speaker. And I did mine on purpose to turn off. But we should also request that the students do the same so that we see where they're at. And we know they're going to be in different environments. My daughter in college, she's a sophomore at the University of Texas. She took many of her classes on Zoom, laying in her bed. And she said, I was fine. I got to roll out of bed, flip my computer over, open, and I'm on video because it was a requirement of the instructors. And so a two-way street, Let's we have our video on. We also ask our students to have them on. Yeah, and, and, and the reason for that is that the slides we show, no matter how good they are, are very static. Your, your students are going to look at those slides and in seconds they're going to understand what you have on the slide. And if there's not something else to hold their focus, uh, they're going to jump to something else. And, and more than likely, uh, for your high school kids for this, uh, for your elementary school kids, they're going to be running for a snack <laughs> and mom's going to run them back to the computer. Uh, you're you're going you're gonna to have a hard time holding them and they may be smart enough to pop up another screen and have a game going on. For sure. uh, so yeah, there's, when you turn on your camera and we can see you, then it's much more dramatic and we are using the three channels of communication, the visual, the vocal, and the verbal. So let's talk about a few of these. I think both you and I do a good job, what I call framing our video and framing it. And, and I'll give some examples of this, where when you're not centered and framed and Bill kind of sliding off to the side there, that, that could be a distraction. And, and what have you seen people do? What are some examples of when the video isn't framed very well? What have you seen, Bill? Well, uh, a lot of it is that the camera is too low. So uh, they, we sometimes call it the nose cam. Yeah, there it is. Uh, nice, uh, yeah, and uh, then also it makes you look like you're really tall, or it, you're off center, and we get, uh, or we get, we get maybe the lip from the nose up, or we're uh, at a, a bad angle. Uh, yeah, all of these camera positions can be just distracting uh, when you sit front and center, and you're looking at the at the camera, filming it like I'm doing here. It looks like now you're in command, in, in charge, and ready to run this, uh, this training and this teaching lesson. And one thing I like to add to that is even stepping back, what I did on this angle was I tipped my camera downwards to where you can see more of my upper body, which allows you then to use some hand gestures and be even more animated. I know one of the things that I struggle with with the video is something, and I'll type this in the chat window to everybody, I call it my RVF. And I don't know if you've run into this issue at all, Bill, but this is my resting video face. My resting video face, you may have heard that differently, but I call it my resting video face because if I'm not aware of what I look like and I take my expressions out, I could come across upset or angry or looking like I don't want to be here. So I think the facial expressions are going to be a big part of this. So the camera position and what, what are some other things that we've think about? Let's, let's talk about lighting for a second. What, what are your yeah. thoughts on that? Yeah, because if you're talking about facial expressions, we want to be able to see your face, which means that we don't want all the light behind us. Man, we've seen this when, you know, the news is interviewing a witness and, uh, and it turns into a big shadow on their face. And now it looks like we're in the witness protection program. <laughs> I don't want to be identified. Uh, depending on how your lesson goes, that might be true. Uh, and so, yeah, we want lighting that is going to be soft in front of us. And really, natural light's the best. But like my office is kind of in the center of my house. I don't have an outside uh, window. So I have light placed around the room so that it uh, is illuminating and you can see my facial expressions and even my ugly resting video face, virtual face. <laughs> uh, so yeah, lighting is key here and we don't want too much light because it'll wash you out for sure. 
Yeah, well, let me do a couple of examples here. I want to show you because in my office, I struggle a little bit and I'm going to go because I've got a window to my left. And then I've got, I'm going to move the camera here. I've got a ceiling fan above me. But what I also did because the light was very balanced on the left side of my face is that right next to, and this is our video here, I put a little lamp right next to the monitor. I put a lamp and this allows the light to then be a balanced light so that I've got the light from the ceiling, the light from my lamp, and then the light from my window to create that balanced lighting. So I think those are some of the things that we need to think about because it could be kind of scary in certain shadows. Right. Right. Well, there's some other things we got to be concerned about here, too. And not only do we want to be seen and have the right lighting, but we also need the right attire, right? Yeah. Like, can, can I wear just this T-shirt? I've got this T-shirt that I got at South Padre Island. I'm just going to wear it. How's that? Well, I think it looks all right. It certainly, uh, uh, it certainly fits my decorum. I, I think uh, things are great <laughs> when you want to just, you know, chill out a little bit and uh, say, sit back and go, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, all of this is sending a message. So you want to be careful uh, that, you know, we're professional. Now, I think our teachers are going to have a ton of fun with this. For because sure. This will be one of the things they can do, do that's very engaging for your virtual classroom. I know teachers have dress up days and they wear uh, costumes and so forth. Hey, you can still do that and you can have your students do that and show you and, and we can have a lot of fun with it, too. So. Uh, the attire, we certainly want it uh, professional. And if you're virtual, every day is jeans day. How's that? Right? Or, or shorts day. Yeah, or shorts day. Uh, and so in, in this case, we can still do some really fun things with attire with our students. Yeah, it, one of my tricks for this, and I know teachers are going to have this planned out a lot better than we are, but I have three dress shirts hanging on my office door here at home. And that at any time it's like, oh my gosh, I'm jumping into a class. I'm going to go grab a shirt, put it on, and I'm just going to be totally transparent here. I don't even button it all the way down. I button it about three-fourths of the way down, and it's really odd during breaks as I'm walking around the house. My wife's looking at me, and I'm wearing a dress shirt and gym shorts and my shoes, <laughs> and so it doesn't kind of coordinate very well. Ah, well, they only said, just to remember, don't stand up and walk away with your camera still on. Yeah. <laughs> that will be yeah. key. The key yeah. is... Keep yourself on mute during the breaks and keep your video off. Make sure that's there before we stand up. Now, background being another thing, thinking about what's behind us and so that we don't create a lot of distractions. And then also thinking about movements. And I, I think right. sometimes for me, Bill, I like to just make sure I'm grounded. I've got right. my feet on the ground. And, and even though I've got a twisty chair, I can keep my feet on the ground to make sure that I stay grounded. Because again, if there's too much of that, that turns into one of those distractions. It sure does. And that means also hands, teachers. You certainly will want to use hand gestures, but in a virtual setting, you want to be careful that your hands aren't too close to the camera, as you can see that we have a perspective uh, issue. So uh, like Kevin said, you can back up a little bit, you can use it, but keep your elbows bent pretty tight and have your hands close to your chest, to your body, and even though it, it's very close to me, for you, there's no 3D, so it, uh, it works. And now you can gesture and your hands look like they're in the normal size. Mm -hmm. Yep. Now, what about the backgrounds? I mean, Zoom allows us to have these virtual backgrounds and they can be fun, yeah. but... Yeah, and I'm thinking that our teachers, uh, again, can have some fun with that, but we wanna be careful too that it's not overdone and that the back background is taking away from the message that you're delivering. Uh, we want, we want uh, a lot of clarity in the lesson and what it is that the next steps and the activities they're going to be doing. And we don't want them thinking about what's going on behind them. Now also, Zoom is going to require a pretty good processor. I, I'm thinking you're about a seventh generation processor to make that work. So That's correct. Uh, I know school teachers, a lot of times <laughs> the computers aren't always the cutting edge. So play with it and see if it works. But you could have some real fun with that too in your, in your teaching. Yeah, be cautious because if you don't have the right processor, you'll, you'll look like a ghost. Yeah. And, and it can be a, it can really turn into a bit of a distraction. And so I'll just show you an example of one that I think would be fun. I mean, it's, I'm in the beach here now. Um, Bill, I hope you're jealous. But do you see how part of my head looks like it's, or part of my hair looks like it disappears? I'm losing my hair a lot faster in this virtual environment than I would normally. Yeah. 
But those are some of the things that could happen when we don't have the right background or the right processor. So let's be careful. Now, I did find a couple of what I thought were appropriate. What do you think of these, Bill? Appropriate backgrounds for, for school teachers to use if maybe I'm in a situation like my kitchen or my living room and I don't have a home office. What are your thoughts on this? No, these are great. In fact, uh, I'm thinking teachers, you could go in and take a nice picture of your real classroom and just upload that into your, your computer and you could use that as a background. Yeah, that's a great idea. I love it. And, and again, just thinking about what, what you've got set up so that we don't create a lot of distractions. And, and I feel like we talked pretty good about posture here, just really thinking about this, because I think one of the issues that I've really struggled with over these last couple of months is some back problems. Mm. Sitting in this chair doing virtual classes, like I'm so used to standing, we're so used to moving. And yeah. now all of a sudden I'm in my chair for six or seven hours in a day and I've had some lower back problems. So really thinking about your posture and how you sit up, not only does it open up your diaphragm and allow you to project, but it's going to help your back in the long run. So any thoughts on just your posture? Yeah, a very important. A key point for our teachers like Crystal and Teresa who are on here from Round Rock. Uh, you know, they're, they're used to being up in front of a class, running back and forth, being engaged out on playgrounds, doing all these wonderful things and interacting. Now, all of a sudden, uh, life is right here and we have to take care of ourselves. Now, the struggle is that I know that you're, you're up and moving and active. Now, all of a sudden, we're sitting down and we still need that same energy level and to take care of us. One of the things in the diagram here is great. One of the things I do to help me with that is I, I move my back off the back of the chair, which forces me to sit up straight and keep my back, or my back straight and my shoulders back. Also, I do my best to keep my elbows off the desk so I'm not leaning into the, uh, like this. Uh, that, that can send an interesting message. So I sit up straight and and do this. And don't forget, we can stand up. Just make sure your camera comes up with you. and We're not looking at your knees. <laughs> My wife just got a, a, a one of those flexible standing desks and she's been loving it. And I'm really now tempted to want to do the exact same thing because that's what we're used to doing. And if I can raise my desk up to a place where I stand, I, I think I'm going to be able to bring even more energy to our virtual presentations. Yeah. Do you, do you think I speak will get us some new desks? I don't know. I'm going to ask our boss. And we'll, see if <laughs> we'll have to see. <laughs> <laughs> well, that leads us because standing leads us to the vocals. And I think sometimes in a virtual presentation, I've seen some low energy. And, and I get it because we've all been there. Bill and I, you and I have been where I'm in my home office by myself. I don't have a live audience and I can feed off the energy of the students that I'm not able to do here. All I've got are my dogs and they're not reacting to my humor like, uh, like I would expect. And so you, you're really bringing our voice to life so that we don't come across monotone. What's anything that you've thought about here in terms of low energy, monotone? How can we use our voice to really keep our audience engaged? Yeah, and I really think uh, with our teachers, Kevin, we're speaking to some experts on being able to use their voice. I mean, these are a group of people that unlike most of us, are in front of an audience every day. I mean, that's been their history. Of course, now here we are doing something that we never thought we would do as teachers, sitting in front of a computer and teaching online. Yep. Uh, and, and the struggle is that we move from that great energy in front of the classroom to sitting down in front of a little camera and a screen. And if we're not careful, our energy drops and we'll start to fall into some monotone because you know, this isn't our favorite place to be. It's not my number one choice. Our students are feeling the same way. So we have to bring it, right? We have to bring the energy. The things you've taught us about, you know, getting back, using your, your, your hands, uh, also standing up, all of these things will help bring the energy to the voice. Realize also that when we are speaking into a microphone and it's being recreated in a speaker off site somewhere, there's a little energy that's lost in all of that transfer of, uh, of, of the voice and recreation. Yeah. So bring it more, be more dramatic, uh, act like you're still in front of that class trying to get their attention, even in this virtual setting, and, and they'll hear the energy on the other end and stay engaged. Yeah. Passion is what will drive it. 
for sure. And I also find it to be contagious that if I'm listening to a speaker who's bringing the energy, then I'm getting energized listening to them as well. So I hope that you and I are modeling that for the teachers as well during this session. So those are some of the things. And Bill, we could get through all of this information a lot faster if I just picked up my pace. And I'll do that right now. We'll talk about all the different aspects that we'd go through. We talk about how to prepare, how to develop, and how to deliver a presentation. Think about how you prepare a presentation. Think about knowing your purpose, your audience, knowing your timing. Think about your purpose. What do you want your audience to know, feel, and do? What is your audience? Who are they? What do they know? How much do they care? You think about structuring the presentation. You always want to grab their attention. You want to make sure you're credible. Make sure that you lay out the body of the presentation. You connect with the audience. You have three points. Make sure you have good supporting material. Make sure you close the presentation with MOS, which is memorable action summary. Then you storyboard your presentation. Make sure that your slides are going to be in congruent with the message. And then you think about the delivery of the message. You want to make sure your words, your voice, and your body language are in sync so that we're not using too many filler words. We're not talking too fast. And then we make sure that our facial expressions, especially our RVF, our resting visual face, isn't going to be a distraction. And then we're done with this webcast. Hey, you just gave us the whole semester right there in three minutes, buddy. <laughs> so we don't want to do that. And it can happen. And so we want to kind of offset that a little bit with landing some pauses. Yeah, so absolutely. What do we do? Give me, give us your exercise, because I know you do this before every class you teach. How do you work on slowing down and focusing and really articulating your words? Yeah, I, uh, I do what a, a lot of my colleagues do, and I'm sure you do it too. I have some favorite tongue twisters that yeah. I use. Uh, and, I, and I like the tongue twisters because they force me to slow down in order to say it correctly. I mean, if I do Irish wristwatch, too quickly. It's Irish wishwash, Irish wishwash. Uh, yeah, right. I mean, it. I have to slow it down if I want to say it correctly. And let me hear the three. Key, let, me, yeah. let me hear three of them. Oh, you want to hear three Irish yeah. wristwatches? Yeah. Irish wristwatch, Irish wristwatch, Irish wristwatch. Excellent. And that's Excellent. about as fast as I can go. <laughs> well, let's get everybody else to do this. Teachers, we've got a bunch of you online with us right now. I want you, you're all on mute. There's nobody that's live microphone. So right now, do it. Try to do it five times and just see how it feels. Irish wristwatch, Irish wristwatch, Irish wristwatch, Irish wristwatch, Irish wristwatch. <laughs> nice hard. pause in there, buddy. <laughs> it's hard. I know, because you're thinking. So tell us the debrief on this, because I know you do it. I, you've told me about this, and I know I like to do this. It's a great warm up for my voice, but what else? Yeah, and, and it really causes me to focus on what's coming out of my mouth. I, I, oftentimes I'll say it correctly, cognitively, but when it comes audibly, it's totally something different. Somewhere along the line, the wires got crossed, some, which happens a lot. There's a, <laughs> there's a lot of gray up there. Uh, yeah, and, and so this helps me really focus on the words that I'm saying and to teach me to be listening to my own voice as it escapes my lips. It also causes me to smile, and that is absolutely key to keep it yeah, exciting and certainly to keep you approachable and create a safe environment, even in a virtual setting. Yeah, so yeah it's, it's Dale Carnegie, right, who says that you want to win friends and influence people. This is one of the top things we do to make that happen is the smile. For sure. Yeah, and that goes back to my RVF, my resting video face, that when I remind myself, and I can never do an Irish wristwatch without laughing at myself, <laughs> yes. I know that I'm bringing a better vocal to it because the tonality of my voice will change in a positive way when I'm laughing or smiling. And then the video face will be smiling. And that's again, contagious for our audience. But one of the things that I want to be careful about when we are smiling is not forcing it because what does that come across? If I'm doing a, a fake smile, what's the fear of that, Bill? <laughs> Yeah, I'm really glad to be here today. Yeah, because your your audience is going to read it, and yeah. and they're going to now you're going to lose credibility. You don't want to be here. We don't want to be here either. What like you said, whatever you come with is contagious. So yep. yes, authenticity. I mean, finding yeah. your authentic voice is going to be key, and it's it's different. I found that my virtual authentic voice is different sometimes than my in person because I've got to get comfortable with the fact that I'm in my home office by myself. Right, right. And I've got to bring a little more dr you know, dr drama to it, uh, more inflection and so forth, so that it translates well through the platform. Yep, 
and we've talked about standing already. I think there's some definite benefits of being able to stand, really be able to project our voice. So we've talked a lot about video, really important. Talked a lot about voice, really important. Let's talk a little bit about the message. Now, we're not going to go deep into this topic because they've already got their plans. They've got a lot of content that they're bringing, but there's a couple of things that we can kind of give some red flags or some warnings about. And what are some of those things that we want to be careful about when it comes to delivering the message? Yeah, and, and again, very different from the classroom to the virtual setting. Uh, in this one, we want it clear, concise, and still complete. So everything needs to be simplified here and that they, uh, that they get it and understand it. It also needs really good organization, very easy to follow. In our virtual world, there's a lot of distractions and your students are going to be faced with those. Kevin, you and I, we deal with leaders within corporations and they have distractions and we're having to deal with it at that level. Certainly uh, also with uh, exactly. Uh, what distractions? With, what, are we what kind of distractions are we talking about? <laughs> yeah, that one that you're holding right there. <laughs> exactly. So having a good organization to your content with simplicity and focus is going to have your audience to stay uh, attention longer and also increase their comprehension and what we all want as teachers, longer retention. Well, and Bill, we're gonna talk about a topic called the rule of three. And I'm gonna queue up a video, kind of set this up for us right here as we think about how we organize the information that we are going to be presenting. How do we organize it in a way for people to be able to follow? Yeah, and, and you start thinking about, uh, there's this great book by Jerry Weissman, um, and, and, he, uh, and he tells us that, don't tell them everything you know, tell them what they need to know. That'll be key. Uh, again, looking for uh, some simplicity. I, I, I mean, if I were the teacher and I said, hey, Kevin, uh, we're, I'm gonna, in our lesson today, I'm going to cover 21 things. Uh, Kevin, what would you be thinking about if I'm your instructor and I just said, hey, we're covering 21 things. And <laughs> my guess is you'd be going nuts, right? Of holy cow, who can remember 21? Right. So the, the rule of three is basically that uh, we learn three things. And all that takes group, and you can even have your students respond to this. What stories have they heard that involve the number three? Where have we seen it as teachers in everything uh, around us? Have we seen uh, three? I mean, even the emergency number that we call is a three-digit number. Why three? Because it's easy to remember. Why are news stations like CNN and Fox and NBC, ABC, CBS, all, again, three acronyms, it's easy to remember and it's lasting, right? That uh, certainly is the key. Yep, so let me queue up this video and it really drives home the point of the rule of three. Schools across the entire country are telling kids today, in case of an emergency, dial 911. If there's a fire, stop, drop, and roll. And they're even sharing stories about three little pigs and three blind mice. Notice a commonality? All are memorable and all are built around the number three. Consider the Latin phrase, omne trium perfectum. It means everything that comes in threes is perfect or every set of three is complete. This trend, well, it actually still exists in our adulthood. Consider this. The TSA tells you to do three things. Show your ID, take out your liquids, and remove your shoes. In 2011, Steve Jobs described a new iPad as thinner, lighter, and faster. Again, the number three. The rule of three is really all around us because it works. Because here is the ultimate thing. The human brain works like this. One, two, three, I forget. Nobody and I mean nobody, is ever going to remember your fourth or your fifth or even your tenth point. So the next time you work on your presentation, aim for this, you guessed it, the number three.
And Bill, it's really key. I love the idea that we can use a video and play a video in the class. Why do we do it? What do we do in our classes and how can the teachers use the video to help create some differential for them? Yeah, well, for one thing, it's bringing some variety and we certainly love some variety. And as, a, as an instructor, it also lets me kind of step back a little bit, look at my notes, see where I'm going. Uh, I mean, I have a great memory, it's just short. So I, I love that little break. But there's something very powerful and engaging about the video. And, and I'm thinking if, uh, you know how, uh, I, I know with my grandchildren, you put on a video, you have their attention. That's the, uh, the power of that. They love watching uh, uh, little videos, little snippets and so forth. So uh, it's a great, uh, a great tool that way. The key though, once we show it, is that we want to be able to debrief it, right? right. And so Kevin, we just watched a, a rule of three video. What was your big takeaway from that particular uh, video we just watched? I don't know. I was on my phone the entire time. I wasn't listening. No, I'm <laughs> yeah. kidding. Okay, so the, here's I, your grade right here, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I love, so let's, let's debrief what we did on that exercise was you set it up, then we shared the screen, played the video. Now it does, does not always work seamlessly where we're going from sharing a slide to sharing the video. So we've got to try to make that as seamless as possible play the video, and then when it's done, we debrief it. We talk about what we learned in there. It's, it really is a win-win. I love the idea that it's a different voice. It's a different medium that we're using to deliver that and it gives us a little bit of a breather sometimes. And then we talk about what we learned in the video and you get the students to share. For me, obviously, the big takeaway, the rule of three, they're, it's all around us. Yeah. That we, we see it not only in all the examples from the video. I always think about on my fireplace, we have three candlesticks. There's a small, a medium, and a large. Why three? Just seems to work. The rule of three works. And so having these little debrief conversations can really make a big difference. Well, and as a teacher, you want that feedback to see if they understand the concepts and now know how to apply them, which is another reason I like the video, because they can show us the application of the, uh, of the rule that we're, we're talking about or the application of the, uh, of the assignment. Yeah, so what do, we, uh, what do we come up with then for three? We're not gonna do 21, we're gonna do three. Keep it simple. So we could, we could have them as just three key points that we'll talk about. So instead of 21 points, I'll say, hey, Kevin, I have three things that we're gonna cover today in our session. And I can tell you, if I'm the, if I'm the student, I'm thinking, that's awesome. Uh, I can remember three things. I can take notes on three things and I can accomplish those three things before our next uh, virtual uh, class. So what could we name them? And I look at them as like three buckets. Uh, and time, depending on how much time you have with the student, how much can I put in the bucket that would be essential for that student to, to be successful? So point one, point two, point three might be the right label for each of your three buckets. For sure. No, I love it. I think that's it's super clear and really easy. And again, this is not where we're going to go really deep into this particular webcast because they've got some lesson plans that they use. Yes. But I love the idea of we need structure. We want variety playing the video. Make sure we debrief it and really trying to follow that rule of three when we deliver our message. I love all that. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about slides and then we'll wrap up with some of the visuals. And, and really, Bill, I'm going to leave with a key takeaway on this. When we talk about visuals, what we don't want is every word we're going to say. We, we talked about that earlier. But instead, we want to really focus on the key point. And Bill, you know this guy. Who is this guy? Well, depending on where you are in the world, he's Wally or Charlie, but we know him as Waldo. Yep. And how do we play the game? Well, you, you try to find this guy, which can be a lot of fun and kill a lot of time trying to find him too. <laughs> so what happens though, if I've got something really important to teach to the students and while I'm trying to teach my slide that's not well designed is really busy, what's my students doing? Yeah, well, we're, we're going to do this for a little while. And then I'm probably going to do this for the rest of it. Absolutely. Now, I know some of you, and we've got quite a few teachers that are on listening with us, they're probably still looking for Waldo. <laughs> yeah. So let me make your job easy 
think he's I found in you. this little circle. I promise he's there. <laughs> I promise he's there. And, and what's my point? My point is that when we're trying to teach and we don't design our slides in a way that complements our message, the slides become a distraction. So the real takeaway from this section is that we want to give our students Waldo, give them the point on every slide, not let them search for it. And that might take some redesign of the slides that we've created. And the real lesson, Bill, let's walk them through some examples here of how to simplify their slides. So what we've seen so, so much is a slide like this, where there's just lots of information. I'm going to be super tempted to read it. Yep. What are some examples of how we could take this and simplify it? Let's say I'm really limited on time. I realize I've got some bad slides. What would you do to this slide? Well, well, first off, I, I, we got to understand the slide is not to be your teaching notes. It's not to show your lesson plan. So in this case, what is the key points on this slide? So real quick, I get rid of all the subtext and just have the four major headings up there of phone support, free delivery, web solutions and support, and award-winning service. I'd let that be the focus of my talking points and the dialogue I would move out of this slide. That'd be the, the easiest first step I would take with this particular one. And I might even want to add some kind of a nice little picture that is really pointing us to whom we are speaking about or the interaction of a person we might have. Yep. Now, Bill, I'm having flashbacks from my seventh grade class with Miss Suggs when <laughs> she had the overhead projector and she oh. would cover up all the information that we didn't need to see yet and then she would scoot that piece of paper down and reveal the next item and then the next item and she was really keeping us from writing all the notes down while she was trying to teach we can accomplish all that virtually by having this come up one bullet at a time so i, I love all those examples well i remember uh back when my teacher was chiseling it in stone so yeah <laughs> i just uh <laughs> We've come a long way. But you said you were 35. Yeah, well, it's a uh, it, it's leap year stuff. So, uh. <laughs> so know your audience, and I love how you gave the great example. We've got a couple of second grade teachers on with us. We've got some middle school and some high school teachers with us. Maybe changing up the way we present it. Maybe it's pictures yeah. that would really make it stand out to make a, a different visual. You you mentioned it earlier about how people learn differently. We learn from seeing. We learn from hearing and we learn from doing, maybe bringing in a different type of visual versus a bulleted list might be the answer. Yeah, yeah, and it's certainly more interesting and will retain it longer because it's easier to remember the image or an icon than remember text. Yep, so a lot of different ways we could do this. Here's one example with the visual. Another example where that we put the pictures in circles and just kind of have a little bit more of a professional look to it. This looks pretty good, Kevin. I mean, I'm, I mean, this looks like it took you hours to prepare this slide. Yes, it did, hours. <laughs> um, using smart art, this slide could be recreated in about two minutes. And yeah. so the smart art feature of PowerPoint can take a really standard slide and make it a whole lot better. And so there's lots of options, pictured options, and then one final one is just- yeah, no words at all, right? Yeah. Yeah, or on the previous one, yeah, no words at all. And what does this do for you, though, as a teacher? How does, how does having no words on the slide help you? Well, in this sense, it's, it's, it's creating some suspense. I, I want to know, what is this? It's interesting to look at. And now I'm going to look at that. I got it in like three seconds. Now I'm looking towards you for you to explain what I'm just seeing here and bring meaning to it. Yeah, so they now rely on us to fill in the blank. So I love that. And then one last example on this is just what I call a stacking. And again, using smart art, we can recreate this one in probably 90 seconds or less. Right. And, and using some different websites to find some, some good clip art. So lots of different examples. I mean, we want to find different ways that we can visually capture the audience and make it memorable. And I think that's the key. Right. Yeah, Kevin, I just had one of, of my clients telling me on, on doing some of this PowerPoint that they did a lot of typing and bullet pointing because they thought that was the fastest way to get stuff on a slide. After showing them the things that you've just showed us here and how to do it, they were able to create beautiful slides with graphics and all kinds of things 
faster than they could have typed it in. They were amazed. And it's not, doesn't take more time. <laughs> it doesn't, it, it's different focus in terms of how we do it, but it doesn't take any more time. Correct. All right, well, let's spend the last few minutes of our webcast talking about the technology, which can be something that we struggle with. And we're using lots of different platforms in the school environments. We're using Zoom, Google, um, Google Classroom, Schoolology. I mean, there's lots of options. In the corporate world, we're using Zoom, WebEx, Adobe Connect, and now we're going to be using Microsoft Teams. Right. And so as we think about all of these different platforms, I'm going to share one thing that I like to do first, and then we'll talk about some of the platforms. The first thing that I do, knowing that I'm about to teach a virtual class, is I check my bandwidth. Mm -hmm. How fast is the connection that I'm on? Because if I realize it's really slow, the first thing I'm going to go do is go talk to my son, who's 22, who's on a video game, or my daughter, who's 19, who's watching something on Netflix, and say, hey, dad needs the bandwidth to teach a class. And so <laughs> this is going to help me in terms of that. And then we get into making sure that the audio is working. You'd mentioned this earlier, but mm -hmm. how do I make sure? And every platform's a little different, but I want to make sure I'm connected to the right microphone and the right camera. What, do you, what, what are your thoughts on this? Well, every platform is going to have a little bit of a, a, a test where you can run through and make sure your audio and your video is working. Run those tests beforehand. Get logged in early enough that you can you know, get in there and make sure it's working. I would even say get in there and learn how to run your slides and so forth so that you feel much more comfortable with your virtual classroom and try to get as comfortable with your virtual as you are with your real classroom. And you're gonna, then that stress is totally taken off of you. Now sure. you're gonna know well enough to even help your students if they're having some struggle on their end, you might be able to tell them how to fix it. For sure, yep. I, I ran into this yesterday. Now it's been a while since I taught a class using WebEx, which I had to do this morning. And so yesterday, it was after hours, I had my wife jump on with me and I said, will you log in, let me log in. I wanna just play with the features. We were gonna be using breakout rooms. I was gonna be sharing a video and I just wanted to get comfortable with the technology since I wasn't as comfortable. It's been a while since I used that and we at, at iSpeak primarily use Zoom as our number one tool. So having that practice time with my wife to, to, to see how it works, it was really helpful for me this morning. Or log in on another machine as a participant and have it sitting next to you and you can see what you're looking at and you can see what your audience is looking at if you don't have that yeah. significant other to help you out. Great advice. And let's add one more, grab your own phone. This is where we can use it. And <laughs> yeah. you can flip over to the video and I'll video myself recording a section just so that I can um, go back and evaluate what's working, what's not working for future times as well. Yeah, and I found that taking my computer in the bathroom and doing it in the mirror doesn't work. No, not at all. <laughs> all right, so let's talk about engaging. I mean, engaging our audience because they don't want to listen to us lecture for hours and hours. Now, this is a webinar. Yes, they are. But in a normal classroom setting, how do we engage? We ask questions. Yeah. And, and what's one of your tricks? So we ask questions, we know to do that, but in virtual environments, where am I answering it and how do I get people involved? Okay, yeah, so a, a real key point right up front is don't, don't throw a question out to the whole class because no one, I mean, everyone's just gonna kind of just fall into the, and never come in and answer it. So call somebody by name first and then ask them the question and then you're going to have a much better chance of getting a response. Otherwise, you're going to hear crickets chirping. <laughs> and then you're wondering, is there anybody out there? <laughs> yeah, so saying a name first, then ask the question. And now you're, can, you're basically starting a conversation, a dialogue with someone through this process. And then you can have follow-ups and they can, you can kind of get that little banter going back and forth. Yeah. Then call on someone else. And you can get a lot of dialogue going on this yeah. way. And there's so many fun things we can do. I mean, I, I remember one of my favorite things to do teaching a facilitation skills class was taking all the names of the participants and saying, listen, we're going to draw a name. And if I draw your name, you're up next. And so that was one way to make sure that everybody got addressed before we went back. And I didn't have the same students dominating and I didn't have those quiet students staying quiet. So that was one idea there. Hey, one of the fun things for you teachers is that 
you know you you're going to put name tags on the desk so you can start memorizing your students names in the virtual hey it's showing up in the participant yeah. list you've got them and now you're going to start putting faces to the names that's yeah, uh, much much easier part. yeah so chat window is obviously a great way to engage we're going to ask questions i love your ideas here about calling them out by name and getting them all involved the poll feature the poll feature is another way. It's a different way to get them to engage. So they're not having to type something, but they're just simply answering a question. Let's, right. let's do one. I'm going to put a poll up right now and we'll have the group respond to it. So let's do that. Now we've got a poll up. We've got, again, lots of folks that are on with us. So I'm, I'm not going to leave it up for very long, but, what do you like best about Zoom? And I just picked a, a random question here. So using polls, live chat, sharing a video, sharing my screen, using a whiteboard, one of just many different tools here. All right, so we've got uh, many, many folks coming in. So th that's an example, Bill. We got to, to see how the polling feature works. When it's all said and done, and I won't do it right now, but we could share the results. I can bring back, I can see who voted where. I can see who didn't vote. And so as you're sharing this in the classroom, it makes a really great way to interact. Yeah, now depending on the platform uh, with like within Adobe, if you're using that, uh, you've got to make sure you're broadcasting the poll results so that everyone sees them. Otherwise, you're the only one who is yes. seeing. And I'm not doing that on purpose here during the webcast, but yes, when you teach a class to always broadcast the results back so that the participants and students can see that. So one other thing, we got a couple of things and we may go just a couple minutes over today to kind of make sure that we really cover all of this content in depth. But I think talking about breakout rooms, and this is something that we use in our professional development training classes. So talk for just a brief second here about where you've used this and how, how the breakout rooms might, and again, depending on the class, I know we've got folks in elementary, middle and high school with us, of how this might be an option for some of their exercises. Oh yeah, I really think it, it can be and be a, a great tool. What we're doing in breakout rooms is we're taking a very large class, putting them into small groups and putting them in their own virtual classroom where they can converse with each other. Yeah. We use it because uh, one thing, we get more involvement in a shorter period of time where there's more practice that could be taking on skill sets that we're teaching and more involvement and a lot of peer feedback uh, it, it is, uh, it's, it, it's almost like having your centers in elementary school where they move around, you could have breakouts where they are uh, with a small team working on a particular topic, and they're just conversing with each other. They don't hear anybody else, they work on their project, then you can bring them back into your main classroom virtually, and you can debrief what they discussed. And this way, they are getting some of that fun socialization where they like to go to school and talk with their friends and they're getting an opportunity to do that while working on a school project by using a breakout room. Uh, and, and as teachers, we can jump into each of the breakout rooms to try to keep them on track. And again, this is where the elementary, middle school and high school might vary, know your audience in terms of, hey, I put them into the breakouts, they're lost, they're not sure what to do. So we can bounce in and be able to see what's going on. My session this morning, we had over 50 people and we were teaching a storytelling workshop. And when I broke the group out, I thought it would make a lot of sense to say, let's do groups of three. And by doing that, we could have all the participants share their stories versus if we had it in one big group of 50, impossible. Yeah. It would take hours to listen to every single person's story. Or right. we'd only get a couple of volunteers. And so the majority of the class would be observers, not participants. Right. The breakout rooms allowed us to do that. Yeah, and boy, who knows better than our educators that you've got to be involved to internalize what the lesson is about. For sure. Well, let's walk through that. I wanna walk them through what to do. If you're wanting to create a breakout room, and I'm gonna walk through the steps using Zoom, but you're going to find, and I did it this morning with WebEx, we've done it with Adobe Connect, we've done it with Microsoft Teams. They're all very, very similar in terms of how it's done. So from the breakout rooms, you're going to choose to name how many rooms you want. So again, this is going to depend on how many students you have. Let's say we've got 15 students and I want groups of three. So I'll choose five rooms. I'll have it done automatically, which it'll have it randomized for me 
the people that will go to each one, or I can manually do it as I drag the names to each of the rooms. When I click go, what it's going to do is create the breakout rooms. Only takes a few seconds, but what the students will need to do is reconnect their audio and video so that in the breakout room, they're gonna be able to see each other. So here's what it looks like. We go from the big class, everybody's together, to smaller pods where people are going to be able to interact with each other. And that small group in the example on the slide is a group of four they're gonna be able to have a much better and I'm gonna say safer conversation because it's only for people versus wanting to do that same sharing in the larger class. And so again, the breakouts just become a really excellent way of being able to facilitate the exercises. Again, know your audience, elementary, middle school, high school, very, very different. Yeah, hey, you explained that very well, Kevin. Uh, uh, absolutely outstanding. Thank you. So, Kevin, yeah, uh, should be I a know, teacher. Yeah, you should. Hey, I know teachers uh, like to get up on the chalkboard or the dry erase boards and be able to, you know, walk people through. Sometimes it's very effective a teaching tool to walk people through, just systematically draw it as we go, write it out. Is that even possible now in our virtual, or am I giving all that up? Absolutely not. Every tool has some form of a whiteboard. And just like you said, I can either show the slide of what we're going to be presenting and say, here's the information, or we go to the whiteboard and the live demonstration makes it so much more real. And me drawing it, and, and I got to work on that because I'm not always great, but same thing happened when I first learned to draw on a whiteboard or on a flip chart. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't great at it, but the more I practice it, the better I got. You'll get better at using this as well. So whiteboard features we've got to be able to interact we can also share our screen and when we share our screen i can share a website i can share a powerpoint deck i can share a video so anything that i want to share and, and always caution you know that that you don't have your email open or you don't have something on your desktop that you don't want somebody to see that uh, that they're going to see it all depending on how you share your screen so be, be right. thinking about what you're going to share and have it planned out ahead of time yeah, so practice doing that uh, transitioning back and forth would be time well spent for sure. Sure. Yep. And, and again, get somebody else to bounce it off because it's always helpful to say, what are you seeing? So that when I click that button, I know what my audience is seeing and I'm not having to guess. And I'm also not nonstop during our class going, what do you see? Can you all hear me? Can you hear the video? Can you see, what do you see on your slide? And that can turn into a really big distraction over time. I have done that, especially with a new platform, and I'm not sure how it's working, uh, and it can be real annoying for sure. Yep, so hey, in practice. all of this, in all of this, Kevin, uh, the big takeaway that I'm hearing is that we just need to be authentic. Uh, try not to be robotic. Don't turn into the GPS voice. Be yourself. Uh, as teachers and educators, you are some of the greatest memories we have growing up and, and being taught. I know I have wonderful mentors in my life uh, through my uh, years of education, both in elementary, middle, high school, and even into graduate work at, at the university. Uh, they have uh, fashioned my life wonderfully because they were real. They weren't trying to be something they weren't, and I truly appreciated that. And that's going to be the trick, I think, in this virtual environment is not to turn into the digital <laughs> uh, that all this is, but to right. still stay very real. Yeah, and create those lasting relationships. I still stay in touch with my fifth grade teacher, Mr. Zemba. Now, he today, even today, will ask me to call him less, which I still feel uncomfortable with. But we exchange Christmas cards, and it's just so awesome that, that from 20 years ago, when I was in the fifth grade, that, uh, that we're still able to create this great connection, this lasting connection where he's gotten to know my kids um, over time. So th this is really, really key. Well, Bill, as we're closing up, let's talk about what's next. We've got so many learning opportunities at iSpeak. We've got this large collection of free webinars from how to create better visuals, to how to design better slides, to creating a structured message, to learning how to tell a story. We, right. we would welcome you to come back and visit us for any of those. And we also, Bill, let's talk about this for a brief second, have a free gift for everybody. Yes. Can you talk about that for a sec? Well, we do. And just going to the link here that you see, you're going to get uh, this, little, this little piece right here that is kind of just a synopsis of what we've been talking about. 
I would see this as a great tool that you could just have right there on your bulletin board next to your computer. And, and there it is, you've got it. And you could just kind of run through it real quick. So a great free gift. I know as teachers, you're always giving out little gifts to all your students, uh, whether you've got the desk fairy going on or some other uh, uh, you know, a reward system. This is ours for yours, for you. So yeah, jump in here. We'll try to get this in the chat window for you. So you've got a, a great tool and then and it's easy one glance you can walk through the check the checkpoints of making sure you've got a great virtual training and a great experience yep and, and stay connected with us on linkedin we've got twitter we've got our youtube channel which we're going to be enhancing and i'm super excited about a couple of months from now we're going to be enhancing our i speak university section on our website and offer a ton of resources to all of our students and all the people that like to stay connected to us. So yeah. I wanna say thanks. This has been a really great experience. I'm so glad that Bill, as teachers, we get to help other teachers. And I wanna say thanks from the bottom of my heart for all the hard work that you guys do to educate our kids. Yes, love our teachers, absolutely. Have a great year. I know it's gonna be kind of crazy for you, but it'll be a memorable one and at the end of the year, you'll look back and say how awesome this has been. I know you will. Uh, thank you for all you do. Thank you, everybody. Take care. See y'all soon.